What is Islam's relevance to the sustainability of civilization? This is the single most pressing and crucial issue facing every human being. Islam might have the, that balance, make it possible for people to live with dignity and to live a decent, comfortable life in this world. And more importantly, to prepare themselves for the hereafter, a life without end. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming to the stage Riyaz Ansari of the United States of America. Brother Riyaz Ansari. Riyaz Ansari. I would like to say as a personal friend of mine, someone I've known for a long time and I very much admire, and I'm honored to be giving this introduction for him, and I'll tell you briefly, just briefly, some of what I know. He was born in Afghanistan, the product of the union of his Afghan father and American mother. His family moved to America when he was eight years old, and after the divorce of his parents, he was raised by his mother. He accepted Islam at the age of 22 and studied for one year in Pakistan. From 1988, to 1993, he studied in Medina University and graduated from the College of Sharia. He then took a position as a translator at the Washington branch of the Imam Muhammad ibn Saud University. He lived and worked for eight years as a da'i in the United Arab Emirates before moving to Malaysia where he currently resides and is working on his master's degree in usul al fiqh at the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the podium, speaking on the topic of Islam's relevance to sustainability and civilization, Brother Riyaz Ansari. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. When I was uh, in college, before accepting Islam, this was in 1973 that I started college. And one of the things, the topics, the themes that captured our attention at that time was uh, a book called The Limits to Growth. It was published by the Club of Rome. And it really put forward this idea that things can't keep going the way they are. The, the way that the world economic system is organized uh, is going to be uh, butting up against realities of limited resources. And this, uh, you know, it became part of my thinking. And when I was in college, I began looking around. I had uh, I had grown up at a time when America was in the Vietnam War, and so I was uh, very deeply affected by that war. And I saw that the American way of life was really founded on um, tyranny. Uh, that what, what the Americans did in Vietnam was just uh, somebody with a 500-pound hammer trying to uh, beat somebody, you know, a, a 98 pound weakling into submission and in the end the, that small little country uh, actually beat the United States. And uh, when I was uh, in college I had a roommate who was uh, a Marxist and we used to talk about the world and what's going on around us and he seemed to have a a very uh, coherent explanation of what was happening. So was, this uh, also affected me to the extent that I actually uh, dropped out of college and I became a Marxist and I studied welding and I wanted to join the working class. 
But when I actually did join the working class, I found that actually they weren't interested in revolution at all. And they were interested in buying houses and doing uh, everything else that people like to do. And when I looked at the American system of life and I looked at the, the communist system of life, I saw that really the, the aim of life in both of them had converged. That the, the aim of life was to maximize production. And it seemed to me that this really is not a basis for a proper understanding of life. It's not the it can't be the goal of life. And so I started looking around, you know. There must be an alternative world view that can give us some way of life that doesn't deny the world as Christianity and Buddhism, etc. They deny the world. I mean, the world is, is essentially evil in the Christian worldview, and it is the source of suffering in Buddhism, and it is illusion in Hinduism. So a worldview that completely denies this world, it's not realistic, it's not balanced. And then on the other hand, a worldview that makes this world the be-all and the end-all of everything, just make your effort here. And uh, you know, the slogan that I used to see on the bumper stickers when I was uh, in the US, whoever dies with the most poise wins. So, I mean, you can't, you can't establish a civilization <laughs> on that slogan. And so it seemed to me, when, as I, when I started to study Islam, I had this kind of sense, an, in, an intuitive sense, that Islam might have the that balance that would make it possible for people to live with uh, dignity and to live a decent, comfortable life in this world, and more importantly, to prepare themselves for the hereafter, a life without end. So that was one of the, the hunches that sort of drew me toward Islam. And almost 30 years have passed since I accepted Islam, and, you know, from time to time we have to stop and take account of ourselves, take account of what we thought, hand out. And so that was the reason that I chose this topic, because it was very important to me as a, as a young person, and it was one of the, the reasons that, that led me to Islam. So what is Islam's relevance to the sustainability of civilization? Because this really, if we leave aside issues of the hereafter, with regard to humanity and our existence on this planet, I mean, this is the single most pressing and crucial issue facing every human being. We are all in this together, and we're all uh, like... Um, passengers on a runaway train. The train has been, it's like the, the driver is, where is the driver? The driver went away somewhere and left the, uh, the throttle on 100%. So the train is gathering speed and we're all just passengers on the train. So it, there's a need to pull back the throttle and put on the brakes. So what does Islam have to, to say about that? And and more importantly, you know, there are teachings and then there is the implementation of them. What do we have as Muslims to offer to this issue? Do we have institutions? Do we have worldview? Do we have people thinking? Do we have people contributing to this issue or not? So going back to this book, The Limits of Growth, and there was another very influential book also around the same time called The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. Uh, so one of the critical fundamental issues that they looked at was population growth as related to the carrying capacity of the earth. 
and demographers, people who study population, they say that around the, the dawn of the age of agriculture, which was maybe eight, ten thousand years ago, something more or less, around that time, uh, the world estimated population, nobody knows for sure, but the, the estimate, somewhere around eight to ten million human beings on the whole planet. Because the, the way that people used to make their livelihood before that was hunting and gathering. And when I was a young kid, you know, they used to tell us that, yeah, you know, life was really hard and then, and then somebody really smart figured out how to plant wheat or whatever and domesticated wheat and then civilization took off. Around the, the dawn of the age of agriculture, which was maybe eight, ten thousand years ago, something more or less, around that time, uh, the world estimated population, nobody knows for sure, but the, the estimate, somewhere around eight to ten million human beings on the whole planet. Because the, the way that people used to make their livelihood before that was hunting and gathering. And when I was a young kid, you know, they used to tell us that, yeah, you know, life was really hard and then, and then somebody really smart figured out how to plant wheat or whatever and domesticated wheat and then civilization took off. Actually, when, uh, when scientists study this more and more, when you look at people who are hunters and gatherers, you see that um, they don't really work that hard to survive. Even people, because in, in our time, the hunters and gatherers have been pushed to the most marginal environments in the world, like the Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert. I mean, they're pushed there because their neighbors drove them out of better lands. And uh, the Bushmen, you know, they work about 20 to 25 hours a week to make their, their livelihood. And the rest of their time is leisure time and time spent with interacting with each other as human beings. And actually one of the things that happened with agriculture was that it made possible states. And it made possible people who would collect the surplus from the peasants and so you have the rise of these institutions like uh, Fir'aun, you know, at the peak of the pyramid, you know, the pyramid being the symbol of Egyptian civilization, a broad base with an elite at the top. So agriculture made possible uh, the development of elites because you could take surplus and store it and it made possible so many of the things that we know about civilization, like writing and uh, the development of, of an intellectual class which were scribes in the time of Egypt and they were linked with the religious organization. So, but the point is, is that the previous way of earning a living, it wasn't um, something that left people just uh, um, starving and and working their their fingers to the bone. I mean, they had lots of leisure time, and their uh, their subsistence situation was stable. The they say that the Australian Aborigines. I mean, they've had a continuous culture in Australia for tens of thousands of years. Now, uh, with agriculture, then you start to have uh, the steady growth of population. Uh, and at the time that Thomas Malthus, the famous British economist who was working in the first half of the 1800s, um, the estimate of world population when he wrote his, his key work on population and economics, in the whole world the estimate was about a billion people. So Malthus looked around and he said, look, uh, 
one couple, a man and a woman, they might have four, six, eight children. And so the population is growing at a geometric rate. It's a, it's a curve that, that gets steeper with time. And food production is growing in a linear way. So there's, there's going to be a point where the two lines cross. And when they do, then uh, misery will become the limiting factor on population. Now, this idea didn't, it hasn't played out as Malthus thought it would so far. Food production has increased dramatically in the last 200 years and it has kept pace with population. And Malthus's theory was actually used by the owners of capital in England as a excuse to pay workers wages that could not support a family. They said if we pay them more it will only encourage them to reproduce more. So we're actually doing a service to humanity by limiting the wages of the workers. So uh, they were imposing misery upon the people in the name of this theory. But Malthus's idea about population growth has been by and large accurate. So that the rate of doubling of the population has decreased with time. Um, when he wrote his thesis, the rate of doubling was something like 180 years for the world population to double. And uh, by 1975, the estimated rate of doubling is 39 years. Obviously, that rate of doubling cannot go on forever. I mean, it's simple math. Uh, Paul Ehrlich, he did the calculations. And if uh, the current rate when he was writing, which is like 1970, uh, if that current rate were to continue, then within a period of 900 years, uh, there would be a hundred people for every square yard of the Earth's surface, including the water, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, even if it didn't include the water, I mean, obviously that couldn't go on. And uh, because I mean, uh, this this concept of doubling, I mean, it's a uh, it produces tremendous. Uh, uh, increases with each doubling. Uh, one popular science writer, Isaac Asimov, he did the calculations and uh, he calculated that if that rate of doubling were to go on for 5,000 years, that the mass of humanity would equal the mass of the universe. <laughs> so clearly the, the rate of doubling can't go on. Um, the responses to that have been on a governmental level, you have the policy of a country like China, which imposes population control on everybody. And uh, they have like a one-child policy. And I think at, at one time, if I'm not mistaken, India also had like forced family planning, forced sterilization. And of course, uh, the, you know, this is extremely abhorrent too. Uh, the concept of human dignity and freedom and it's uh, something that we as Muslims, I mean, we would, we would reject it. The whole idea of contraception has been a controversial issue. I mean, there are scholars like Maududi who considered it to be completely prohibited. The hadiths on the issue, they go back to the, to the issue of al-azl, uh, withdrawal before ejaculation, which was practiced by the Sahaba. And there's many hadiths on the issue and the bottom line is that the Prophet ﷺ didn't encourage it and he didn't prohibit it. Uh, he expressed some disapproval of it, uh, but not to the level of prohibition. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's considered 
the dominant position is that it is permissible to perform azal. And, you know, there are some scholars who say that if the, if the intent is to, uh, to avoid poverty, if it's, you know, it's fear of poverty, then that becomes prohibited for that because Allah is a razzaq. Um, if we look at developing nations, we find that without any imposition of government uh, mandates, that population growth has basically stopped in the West. And so, based on that phenomenon, uh, organizations like the UN and the World Bank and the IMF they look around and say, you know, the answer to this issue is development. If the whole world gets developed, then people will just naturally have smaller families and the problem will be solved. There's a major caveat to that position, however, which is that one person living in the United States of America has 50 times the impact on the world's resources compared to a person living in a poor country like Chad or something like that. So even though the West has a stable population, their use of resources continues to grow. And it's estimated that uh, United States of America, they used more resources since 1900 than all of humanity used before 1900. And America started running out of its own oil in the 70s. It started running out of its own forests. All of these raw materials America was running out of, they turned to other countries to supply them. And the example of England, I mean actually Malthus's projection for England did come true. England uh, is unable to produce enough food to supply its population. So it imports food. Japan, the same thing. Japan cannot feed its population. Half of its grain is imported. So we do have a situation where we're bumping up against the limits of our environment. And one of the, uh, the facts of life in our time the United Nations, uh, their statistical gathering, uh, they say that about 25,000 people a day die of starvation in the world. Now that's not because the world doesn't have, that, that there isn't enough food to go around. It's an issue of access and the way that the world economic system is set up uh, creates this situation.